SOA governance, your questions answered. Uh, I'm Chris Harding, the Open Group Director for Interoperability, and part of my responsibility is to support our members' work on SOA, uh, including the work that we have done on SOA governance, which resulted in the publication of our uh, SOA governance framework. Uh, the purpose of this webinar is to give um, those of you who are participating the opportunity to ask questions of uh, the panelists uh, and uh, to discuss those, for the panel to discuss those questions relating to SOA governance and in particular uh, the SOA governance uh, technical framework of the Open Group. Now, um, I have uh, a tutorial on SOA governance which I can uh, keep as a background information if we need to look at specific points on the governance framework. Um, I see uh, we have on our panel uh, Bob Laird from IBM, who is something of an SOA governance expert. Um, some of his ideas uh, were major uh, factors in the SOA governance framework that the Open Group produced, and he has also um, authored uh, other books and works on SOA governance. Um, and we have um, uh, Jed McSuber from Accenture, who uh, is a a governance expert who has been involved in using SOA governance, uh, and uh, Dave Hornford from Connexium, who is the chair of the Open Group Architecture Forum uh, and also has some uh, experience of uh, applying governance to SOA projects. I will give a brief introduction um, by extracting some of the material uh, from this tutorial to the topic of SOA governance and the Open Group SOA framework, SOA governance framework, I should say, uh, and uh, can I ask um, people, if you have questions, please to uh, submit them online um, using the, uh, the WebEx uh, Q&A facility. I see we don't have any technical questions yet, uh, so let's uh, proceed with the introduction part of this webinar. So uh, SOA governance um, is a means for establishing and enforcing how people and solutions work together to achieve organizational objectives, and it provides the framework for planning, developing, deploying, and managing an SOA solution. Uh, it has uh, benefits of ensuring alignment, establishing controls, reducing cost over time, and mitigating risk. SOA governance does not uh, stand by itself, but it's part of the overall enterprise governance regimen, uh, and it extends IT and enterprise architecture governance um, to ensure that SOA is governed properly. The SOA governance framework is really con concerned with three things, the people, the processes, and the technology, um, and uh, roles and responsibilities of the people and the organizational structure. Uh, the governing and the governed processes, and the technology infrastructure and tools. The SOA governance framework defines an SOA governance reference model um, containing guiding principles, roles and responsibilities, um, some uh, process material, and some um, technology descriptions. And this is uh, this this model is used as part of the overall SOA governance framework, and the key attribute of this framework is vitality. Um, so the SOA governance reference model is the starting point, um, th and taking that as the basis, you use the SOA governance vitality method. Um, to develop a customized and focused SOA governance regimen uh, for your enterprise. And this is not just a one-off process um, because the governance vitality method goes through a cycle of plan, define, implement, and monitor, and that cycle should be repeated to ensure that the 
SOA governance regimen of your enterprise is up to date and vital. Um, so the key governance guiding principles defined in the framework, um, these actually are example governance guiding principles, so I will skip over them. Um, this slide shows an example, again, of governance roles and responsibilities in the context of the example company. Um, the SOA governing processes um, include compliance. Uh, these are the, the three pro processes defined by the framework, compliance, um, dispensation, and communication. Um, compliance is the mechanism for review and approvals. Um, you have to have a dispensation mechanism um, in case that compliance mechanism is too rigid for particular cases. And key to the governance process is communication um, to educate people about SOA governance and to communicate uh, what it is they need to do. Here are some examples of um, how those processes uh, might apply in particular contexts. Uh, and again, further examples. Uh, now, this slide shows the SOA governance, governed processes, um, and these really uh, can be viewed on two axes, um, the solution versus service and the planning versus design and operational axis. Um, and there are basically four processes solution portfolio management that ensures you have the right um, portfolio of SOA solutions, um, service portfolio management that ensures you have the right portfolio of services. These services are what your SOA solutions are built from. Uh, and then the life cycle uh, processes in the uh, solution life cycle and service life cycle uh, management processes. And those are the uh, those at the top of the slide sh are shown as the key governed processes. At the bottom of the slide, um, there's a, a slight expansion that shows how they relate to each other. Um, and these again are showing how this applies in the context of the example. Um, the val vitality method, as I explained, is uh, repeated. Uh, it's not sufficient to simply define a governance regimen and, and leave it, particularly for SOA. It is important to keep it up to date as circumstances change uh, and the cycle consists of planning, um, defining, implementing, and monitoring uh, your governance regimen. Um, and this summarizes um, what we've been over what SOA governance is, uh, how it relates to other governance structures, because SOA governance is not standalone. Um, it is in the context of enterprise and IT architecture governance. Uh, and we've looked uh, a little at what high-level governance structures and processes need to be put in place. Um, and from this, uh, the conclusions of all this, governance is the means of ensuring that enterprise operation aligns with business goals. This is crucial. The whole point of all this is to make sure that you're aligning with the business goals of the, opera, of the, of the enterprise. Uh, good governance is needed if SOA is to realize its business potential. This is crucial. Um, and the SOA governance framework of the open group includes an SOA governance reference model that describes the processes, organizational structures, and enabling technologies for SOA and a vitality method that enables you to customize these to produce uh, the uh, customized governance regimen for your enterprise and to update this over time to keep it relevant. Um, and good SOA governance enforces continued compliance with an enterprise SOA reference architecture. So um, that really is a summary of what the Open Group SOA governance framework is about. Um, and I suggest we now move into 
the discussion phase of this webinar, uh, and I'll start by uh, asking the panelists um, to uh, put forward their questions on this and to just kick the discussion off. But again, please, will all participants, as you come up with questions, uh, put them forward on the Q&A facility uh, of this session? Okay, so perhaps we could start, um, Bob, um, you're perhaps the, the primary SOA governance expert amongst us. Uh, do you have any, any comments to make on that overall summary, any questions that come out of it for, for you? So uh, th thank you, Chris, and uh, I'm not sure I del deserve that acc accolade, but um, I'll, I'll have to deal with it, I suppose. Um, one of the, one of the common um, questions that um, and, and concerns for people on civil governance that you typically hear about is is where do we start? And so um, it's great that there's uh, now an open group uh, reference model and a vitality method, um, but those those are uh, guidelines as to um, how to, how to structure your your governance. So. Um, the answer, of course, is it depends, but um, that, that, that seems a, a bit uh, too um, disingenuous. So um, one of the, I think in general, one of the really good areas to start in governance is, is to look at um, your uh, development methodology and your governance around that. So most everybody has a very good service development life cycle, and, and there's at least some sort of governance around it. Maybe peer reviews. Um, it, it may be uh, you may have some level of architectural reviews, so something of that nature. Um, when when you make the transformation from systems to services, things are a little bit different. The, the concept of the uh, contract of the service, i.e., the specification. Um, is, is very important in a SOA type governance environment as opposed to an IT type governance environment, more, more important at least. And, and so uh, identifying what the state transitions are in your service development life cycle and what the control points are around, around those, who, who needs to approve, who needs to review, um, brings a level of discipline and specificity to your governance that or at least to your SOA governance that perhaps you haven't had before. Um, in, in addition, it's um, it's something that we, especially in IT, are comfortable with. Um, you know, we've had experience dealing with again the service development life cycle. There, there's been some level of governance, hopefully, around that, and so it's not too much of a leap to then say, okay, so what are the things that we have to do from a so a governance point of view in a in your um, development life cycle, what what are the again the states, what what are the control points, what what are the things that we have to do in order to ensure quality um, in in our services, and some of that can be more difficult than others, especially um, I've in my experience I found um, dealing at the front end with um, requirements for services, particularly non-functional requirements. And then also dealing at the back end with um, our handoff to production to operations, and having the appropriate kinds of um, governance checklists. Um, nevertheless, it, it is an area that we hopefully have have has had some experience before with, and, and so it's not too much of a leap to try and get um, good good governance going in that respect. And then the other the other area that I would say is a good place to start. Um, Chris touched upon organization. Um, Typically, we're moving from a silo-type environment um, for our, our uh, systems development to a more shared environment, more horizontal environment for our um, for our services. And so, uh, consequently, your organization needs to uh, evolve into having at least some groups that are more horizontal. So, so typically, there should be some sort of shared uh, services architecture board. Architecture Review Board, um, whatever you want to call it, um, and then uh, at the uh, more executive level, to, in order to provide guidance and prioritization and that sort of thing, um, there should be some sort of executive board. Executive re Review Board is, is sometimes uh, used. 
And then associated with that, um, uh, Gartner used the term center of competency. You will see center of excellence, um, some, some sort of uh, group that is responsible for, for uh, providing adult supervision across, across the organization and to identify uh, the things that, at a more macro level that, that make sense. So I, I think if you focus on those two things and start to develop um, a level of expertise, and confidence in terms of your uh, service development life cycle, the governance around that, and then what are the horizontal um, organizations, um, that, that that's, that's an excellent start. Thanks very much, Bob. Uh, so that's a, a good introduction to, to, to getting started with, with cell governance. Um, Dave, I wonder if you could comment on, uh, first of all, perhaps you could give a little background on, on, on your involvement with um, SOA. Uh, governance and, and, and related projects, uh, and what are the issues that, that you've uh, found uh, when uh, trying to put a SOA governance regimen in place? Certainly, Chris. Um, my background is I'm a consultant. I run an organization that is focused on helping architecture teams be effective. And in the SOA space, the, the, the vitality method that Chris has talked about and Bob talked about are key, particularly when you go and look at the image that you had up, Chris, which looks at the interaction between portfolios, solution portfolio, service portfolio, solution lifecycle, and service lifecycle. Could you flip back to that one? Um, the, the key element for us as an organization who helps architecture teams become more effective is helping them understand the distinct elements that operate differently. And the governed processes, originally people look at this and they go, oh, I have to do so much work. I have to worry about my portfolio. I have to worry about my services. I have to worry about my solutions. The answer is you do. Because if you do not do good governance, you are going to get almost none of the benefits of good service-oriented architecture. The reusability, the agility, the ability to re re reconstruct elements of your business aren't possible if you can't manage that life cycle. And the key element here, um, particularly if people want to go down a loosely coupled path, which is your contract must have terms of change. What is the offering and when will, are the terms of change from the offerer of the service? The other element in terms of an implementation that it is governed that we've found is absolutely critical in a loosely coupled is the testing paradigm needs to be um, adapted so that the services being consumed have to fail predictably. Because if you're loosely coupled, you may be consuming services that you're not interacting with the service provider. How will you tell when you're orchestrating something that this overall SOA solution is working properly if you cannot test for predictable fail? Those are the, the, the key elements that we found in, in terms of using it is being very clear that the portfolio and the life cycle need to be considered and absolutely critical is the, the, the contract. Any any basic questions from there? Okay, well, be, before before we take, take further questions, I'd, I'd like to give uh, Jed uh, a, a chance to to comment in a similar way on uh, on his experience with with, with SOA governance uh, and uh, issues he sees with the, the governance framework. Sure, thanks, Chris. Um, so so I've been I've been involved with designing and implementing SOA solutions um, since the early 2000s, and I guess you can you know if you look at if you want to uh, include some of the core work I did back in the late 90s, it's been, you know, I've, I've been thinking about this for a while. 
I've, I've, I've had, I guess, the, the, I don't know if it's pleasure, but the, the fortune of implementing, designing and implementing services in large organizations where SOA governance both existed and where it didn't exist. Um, I think one of, the, one of the key learnings that I've had over the years in seeing those two scenarios is, is an organization can, and, and many follow this pattern, where they absolutely can do web service development without having SOA governance in place. However, one of the key messages that, that we need to communicate to our, our customers or, or our business partners is if they really want to achieve the maximum value that SOA really can bring to the table, then a SOA governance framework is, is absolutely critical. So, um, you know, many times in, in helping my customers roll this out, it's, it's really around communicating the, the value of SOA governance. Um, you know, not probably not surprisingly, governance is 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 viewed um, kind of uniquely in in many organizations, especially by the development community, where they see governance as being unnecessary overhead. Uh, you know, a couple a couple points to that is that um, you know the, the governance is meant to add value, right? So it's it's a constant change management and a communication mechanism to say that what we are implementing when we roll out a SOA governance framework is really intended to add value to your organization. It's to ensure that you're designing services, service interfaces and implementations according to best practices and standards, that you're ensuring that the services themselves deliver maximum value to the business, uh, that the services themselves are able to be shared um, across the organization. Um, so it's it's very much a, a change management communication a, as it is anything. So um, any any questions on that? Well, we have uh, we have one question from uh, Rude Roymans, um who is asking, and, and all three of you have talked about. Uh, why SLA governance is, is, is crucial and uh, what are the things to do to get it set up. Uh, the question he's asking is, what are the common pitfalls when setting up or executing SLA governance and how best to overcome these? What are the things that you've observed uh, that uh, people, um, the errors that they might fall into uh, and um, how, do you, uh, how do you make sure that people don't make those mistakes. So this is Bob. I'll, I'll go first. So, so one of the common pitfalls of governance, and I think Jed uh, and Dave both alluded to this, is that um, if, if governance um, is too difficult or it's not adding value, um, people will stop using it, will work around it, will ignore it. And so um, to the extent that you can automate um, your governance and make it easy to use and, and show that it adds value, you know, that's that's a good thing. So I talked before about the service development life cycle and one of the things that, that you can do is it's a degree that you could say automate um, your your um, development governance, um, perhaps run be able to run your, uh, your code, your programs through uh, um, a, a machine that would check and your, with your uh, development policies and, and indicate to the developer where they they have an issue, then then governance almost becomes fun. It's it's uh, it, it becomes rel relatively easy to do. Um, so and then I think the other thing is that um, what what tends to happen a lot of times is uh, governance flounders upon the rock of uh, groups having to work together. And um, siloed organizations are not used to working together. They may regard the other organization as the enemy. And so it's impossible to over-communicate. Um, so to the degree that you can um, replace fear, uncertainty, and doubt with um, brown bag lunches, talking about the, you know, the plan, with communications um, uh, that identify um, what's going on with one-on-ones, with um, um, seminars that talk about the technology. I mean, anything you can do 
to help uh, communicate among the different groups that are having to work together now um, is, is a good thing. Okay. Um, Dave or Jed? Sure. Uh, comments right to that? Sure. Th and this is Jed. And, and, you know, from my experience in terms of common pitfalls, I think the, many of them were just captured. But, but one other thing is, is making sure that you're starting at the right level. Um, so within, within the, the governance framework, there's um, a point or two, the SOA maturity model. So one of the things that, you, that certainly in my experience, and I would recommend it that you don't want to do, is you don't want to um, overburden the organization with unnecessary governance. I mean, the framework itself is very robust. There are many different parts to it. But what's key is to understand really where the organi organization sits from a maturity standpoint, and you're tailoring the governance framework to be specific to their needs. Again, depending upon where they are in the spectrum, they may be dealing with really fundamental basic issues like not having a common service development life cycle that you can pretty easily go in there and very concrete, you know, deal with that. Um, if they're if they're at a nation stage and they have organization issues, um, while very important, going in initially, that may not be an area that you really want to uh, focus on too strongly. So, I guess the message is just making sure that you tailor it to the customer's needs or your needs uh, of the of your organization, as opposed to just taking the framework itself holistically and just uh, you know putting it in place. Uh, thanks, Jed. Dave, anything to add to that? Um, well, first off, Bob and Jeb are right, and the the second unique add that I'll I'll bring in is people need to be very clear about distinguishing between a management process and a governance process, and not blurring the line between the the activities undertaken to manage something and manage an activity, manage a development activity manager change program and governing it. The second aspect is, for me is absolutely critical if, of, of understanding the distinction between when you are loosely and when you are tightly coupled. Because if, if what we're doing is building web services and calling it service-oriented architecture, but all of our web services are tightly coupled, um, unorchestratable, unisolatable, activities and we're using web services as an integration tool, that governance activity is no different than how you would govern any other tightly coupled development activity. When we move to the area of our services actually exist and can be orchestrated and can be consumed, we're in that place that Jed talked about where we're now having organizations that are not used to working together. Somebody I don't know of in my organization is consuming my service. Somebody who is external, there's a question we'll probably get to on consumerization and mobility, is consuming my service. And in that space, our governance becomes absolutely critical around what is the life cycle of that solution and that service so that we can deliver predictability. Because if our services, because we're not used to working together and we're following a tightly coupled operational model and that any, web, any service that is provided will never succeed in the transformation and the goals that we're looking for because I can't rely on it being predictable. And the goal of the whole um, Governance and life cycle management is ensuring predictability for things that you're just going to reach out to and consume. I can't stress enough in our experience where we see people again and again fail because the services are not predictable, because they are carrying forward activities that are applicable to tightly coupled operational models. Uh, Chris, this is Bob. I, I have one other thing to add, and I uh, certainly agree with what Dave just and Jed talked about. Um, broadly speaking, SOA is, and, and again, this is a very macro level, so take this with a grain of salt, but 
you're really talking about SOA at two levels. One is more of a technical level where you're concerned about, you know, the SOA principles and, and uh, you know, loose coupling and um, development life cycle and, and, and that sort of thing. And, and that's typically where we see uh, SOA start and SOA governance start. Um, the, the, the second level is more at, at a more business uh, level where you're trying to engender agility. You're trying to use your services um, in a fashion that, that helps you create that agility in the organization. And I think in that latter, um, more, more business-focused, agility-focused SOA, um, cha change management, uh, which is, while important at the technical level, becomes even more important at the, um, at, at the, the business-focused level. And uh, th there's a guy from uh, Harvard named John Carter who's, who's written a wonderful book about leading change and change management that uh, I urge everybody who is um, really interested in, in governance and leading change to uh, get a copy and read. But uh, in it, he talks about the, the eight steps that you have to um, uh, go through in really leading change. And, and at the end of the day, that's what SOA and SOA governance is about. So, so governance ends up being to some degree adult supervision over, over the uh, the organization, and, and it's it's a lot like being a parent. And if you don't look at it from that point of view of you really are leading change and you're making you're making things different, which is tremendously uncomfortable for a lot of people, that those people will fight you and, and could ultimately defeat you. That and that's that's one of the anti patterns that I think is is very common. That, that we see when, when there is failure. Okay. Um, we have a question from Christopher Harkio, uh, which is, did I see, hear you say that organizations are slowly moving away from system development life cycle to service development? Um, I'd actually like to generalize that question a bit, if we can. Uh, because SOA has now been around for quite a few years. So um, perhaps what I'd like to ask people is, what are the trends that you see, the underlying trends that you see in the way that organizations are using SOA, uh, and how does this impact on the governance? Is it making governance easier, or is it making governance uh, more difficult for SOA? What's up, Dave? So this is Bob. I, I guess I'll go first, unless okay. Dave or Jed want to go. No, okay, so I'll go first. So, um, uh, yeah, I think um, SOA has, has, to some degree, become accepted and, and yesterday's news. And, in fact, one, one of the common things, uh, that w decision points that you make is, you know, is, is, is this a, a build or a buy decision? Is it a systems um, that we need to create, or is, is it services that we need to create? And so, uh, so certainly the needle has moved more towards services. That doesn't mean that everything is a service, of course. Um, has this made um, things more difficult? Um, yeah, I, I, actually, I think it has because um, trying to to uh, work across organizations and and build software that that is going to work in a variety. Uh, for a variety of, of needs is more difficult, requires more communication. Um, it, you're probably working with people that are not necessarily co-located with you physically. And, and so that, that requires more governance, uh, all other things being equal. Um, on the other hand, you know, is the benefit that you get from that, from that reuse and agility worth that? And, and that's the question that you have to ask. Hopefully the answer is yes, and, and therefore it makes sense to pay that price. Dave, I think that um, was picking up on, on one of the points you were making about the, uh, uh, the fact that you don't know who your con consumers are, um, and, uh, and it's, 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 it's more difficult in that environment to, uh, uh, to put a governance regime uh, in place. Um, but do you think perhaps that the fact that um, people are now getting more used to doing this is, is making it easier, or, or are we discovering um, new issues as we as we go along? 
I would say it's both, Chris. This is Dave. Um, and the big trend that I'm seeing is people understanding the distinction between Bob's categorization of two levels, so at a technical layer and so at a business layer. Too often in the past we blurred the outcome and the target of what we were trying to achieve. And understanding that we can solve some things technically and we can solve some things at the business level. And the critical element as you identified is that when we start to develop services that are consumed by people we don't know and don't interact with, that predictability, the life cycle portfolio management becomes absolutely critical because the consumer has to rely on a service at the same time as that we, the service provider, has to be able to adapt and move the service forward. And that requires uh, like Bob's phrase, adult supervision. Because if you're delivering something to someone you don't know, how do you communicate that there's a change without there being some overall portfolio and life cycle governance activity? And I know I keep harping on that one, but that's uh, the, the one area where we recurrently see attempts to get to, as, as Bob Cost did, as so at the business level with agility and flexibility, not delivering because we organizations will not jump that hurdle. This is Jed, and I absolutely agree with Dave and Bob's comments. And I think categorizing the technical and business, I guess, angles is, is absolutely appropriate. And in terms of making it more difficult. Certainly, you know, my experience is on, on the technical side, so as, you know, an architectural design pattern, um, it, it's well accepted by the IT community. Um, sometimes they, they may use it in places they shouldn't and vice versa, but I think technically it's, it's well accepted. Clearly, the, the, business, the business aspect, the organizational aspect is, is clearly a lot more difficult um, and it's something that organizations are continuing, continually trying to figure out how it, it, it fits within, you know, their organizational structures because n no organization is, is the same. They're all different. They, they have different personalities. And trying to be successful with the true vision of SOA is something that needs to be worked. I know in, in a customer that I'm dealing with now, in fact, they're in a position where they know who all their consumers are, and it still doesn't make, the, make it any easier because the different consumers have different incentives, different objectives, different timelines, and trying to get them to work together to make a decision on something, um, I don't want to say as simple, but you know, a, a change to a service interface, it's very complex, and, and you can understand the, the implications it has. So we, as part of this organization, we had to understand in, in an environment that is very, very siloed uh, by product, you know, how can they organize themselves around the concept of building these reusable shared services? What kind of decision-making authority needs to be put in place so that two groups that don't have alignment in their objectives are not simply going out and building two similar sets of, of assets? Um, he put in place, uh, and I think it was mentioned perhaps by Bob earlier on, um, we put in an executive level, we call it the SOA steering committee, that is comprised of the CIO and his direct reports, all the product line heads, and they're responsible for when there are, you know, essentially they provide the escalation path. So um, they're not understanding all the, the details that are going on in the organization, but clearly when we have something that's designated as an enterprise level asset and there is, um, there is conflict in terms of the direction, then we need to get the executive uh, involved in, in helping to uh, disposition the, uh, the, the issue at hand. Okay. Uh, if there are more comments on that question, uh, we have Another one from uh, Prasantji who asks, could you please share experience in adoption of the governance model? What are the factors that affect the adoption model? 
uh, is the technical competence or cultural aspects of the organizations uh, are these the factors uh, what are the what are the major factors uh, that affect uh, how the SOA governance model is adopted uh, so um, that's a, a, a pretty general question but it's it's really asking for what what are, what are people's experience in practice of this so it's Bob, I'll go first. Uh, I, I think from a technical SOA governance point of view, to, to the degree that you've laid things out um, well and, it, and it's obvious what needs to be done so, so the tech, technical, the programmers, whatever, are not having to guess at what they need to do. They're, in other words, there's a well-defined process. Um, and uh, to the degree you've made it as easy as possible for them, that, that all of those things uh, aid acceptance. And then I think at the business level, as I mentioned before, um, change management is is crucial for for that level of, of SOA governance. Okay. Yeah, I, I, this is Jed. I would say, if they don't know they're doing it, that's the easiest way to get it adopted. <laughs> I mean, that governance in general is like that. SOA governance is no different. As much as you can do, like Bob said, to to simplify it, um, so they know exactly what they can do. Um, any opportunity you can have to automate the the governance uh, functions, you want to definitely look at, at tooling automation. I would not lead with that, but certainly tooling is a good um, is a necessary uh, part of implementation. And if there are existing governance processes in place, um, then certainly you want to look for opportunities to leverage those. And just to give you an example. Um, so one of my clients, they already had as part of their their IT governance framework, they had the opportunity or they had a process in place to do architectural level reviews of their solutions. Um, clearly leveraging that to take a look and say, well, as part of your solutions, are you building the enterprise level services according to what your organization has laid out from a target state? Um, is something that they can ask that additional question or look at that as part of a process that the organization is already doing today. So it's not saying, well, let's define a new process uh, to look at the services aspect of your solutions. It's, it's built into a process that already exists. So I would say probably those three things can help increase adoption, as well as communication and change management. Okay. Anything? Uh, Dave, there to uh, add to that. So I'll, I'll take the job of, of summing up because, again, I'm agreeing with Bob and Jed. And I'm going to reach back to a comment Jed made about maturity. What problems is your organization capable of solving today? Whether you look at the maturity model for SOA, at what technical capabilities you have, and what are the underpinning organizational capabilities? The, the example of a highly siloed organization is, is key because your governance activity has to be culturally aware. So we can give you some examples, but they're based upon, well, this organization works this way, so that worked. But being culturally aware and tying as closely as possible into existing governance activities, into existing reporting activities, so that we can reuse what the organization is already doing so that we're not creating more burden and helping it be invisible because people are used to doing what they do now. And if we can use what they're doing now to do effective SOA governance, it doesn't look like they're being asked to do more, if that makes sense. That's what I would focus on, being aware of your maturity, your culture, and reusing existing processes and bodies in an organization. Okay, so I mean, it's sounding from we're all agreed that the, the culture of the organization um, does make a, and, and the, the not only the culture, the culture and the, the expertise of the organization um, does make a big difference to the way uh, that you need to approach governance. Um, that you uh, must be careful. To, uh, not to try and put in some in place something that doesn't really suit the organisation, uh, and I guess this probably also reinforces the need to 
uh, be able to update uh, your governance regimen as the organization matures and, and, uh, and develops its expertise for SOA. Um, there was a particular point, I think, that a couple of you have picked up on, uh, which was the value of uh, automation in, uh, in SOA governance. Um, and perhaps I could ask, are we seeing uh, more and better tools appear? Is this something that uh, really the enterprise has to try and craft for itself if it wants good tools? Or are we finding that there are tools available, perhaps open source, uh, for, for, for people to uh, take advantage of? Do you, uh, Bob, uh, particularly, uh, uh, do, you, do you sort of have a feel for how the tooling situation is going with, with SOA governance? Yeah, so, so uh, are, are there tools out there that are good? Yes. Um, are they getting better? Yeah. Um, I think um, to some extent there hasn't been as much investment in governance tools um, because uh, I, I think governance has uh, not been as um, – had as much uptake as, as SOA itself has. So SOA governance is, I think, behind SOA in terms of its uptake and, and perhaps its its use. So um, I, I think the trend is, is has been in the right direction, but um, I, I wouldn't say that there's, uh, you know, just just a ton of, of really focused uh, um, tools in, in, in terms of automation at, at, uh, at, at a detailed level. There's, uh, there's certainly tools that will help you do governance, and, and there's a lot of solo governance tools out there. Um, itself, and and they are they are helpful, but I, I think this area is still emerging to some degree. Okay. Want sure. To this is Jed, and and um, I would you know I agree with with Bob in terms of what I'm seeing. I think one of the, one of the key things, and as you roll out your governance framework um, to the organizations, and you look how to you know use a consultant consultancy term, you know, operationalize or, or make real in the organization, um, clearly there's a number of tools that you can put in place to automate those. So if you think of, you know, the, the registry repository tools that are out there, um, you know, those are, I think, in as far as if you look at development time and runtime run tooling, right, because those are different categories. But, um, you know, you look at the tooling to support those, clearly the registry repository is one of those, but there are other tools that you can use to help automate your processes um, in addition to those two, two that will help make it easier for, you know, both the development community as well as uh, those members of the organi organization that are doing the more strategic or, or planning level activities. So I would encourage you to, you know, think about it more holistically and and ensure that the tooling that you pick is, is positioned properly and it, and it fits the role within the governance framework that, that you're intending it to do. Okay. Uh, any comments on that, Bob? And if not, as we are approaching the end of the hour, I'd like to uh, to ask you all one uh, one final question um, that uh, you might like to comment on, uh, which would perhaps also contribute to our understanding of uh, of the SOA governance framework and how it should be used, and perhaps also uh, uh, be of use to any future development. Um, given that we have the Open Group SOA governance framework, which has uh, been in place now for uh, a couple of years. Um, if we were to uh, think about revising that, what would be the main points that you would see that it might be important either to change or to, uh, to, to give a different emphasis to? Okay. So um, I, I would say the, the framework at the level it is now, that, that part's fine. Um, I, I think if we had... Uh, right people and time and resources that, that taking that down to a next level so 
perhaps providing more specific uh, uh, guidance um, in, in, in the various uh, entities would be good. I, th I think another interesting thing, you know, we, we have a SOA maturity model. We don't have a SOA governance maturity model. So um, I, I think uh, that would be another um, interesting area that, that we could add to the uh, framework. That's an interesting thought. SOA governance maturity. Um, okay. Dave, any, any, any thoughts on, on this? I would focus on two things if I were involved in redoing it. Um, one is highlighting that the processes identified and the activities identified are not necessarily new processes or activities. What we were just talking about in terms of adoption, using existing governance activities, but asking one more question at your existing architecture review adding something into your software development life cycle to provide the pieces, be highlighting that the framework are things that you must do, but they don't have to be standalone activities, which I think overcomes the burden because one of the things we see people doing is going, oh, SOA governance, I'll set up a separate SOA governance apparatus in my organization to pursue it. And the, the second thing is echoing what Bob talked about, which is a maturity or a, not necessarily a maturity model, but maybe a value model. Where am I going to get more value out of service-oriented architecture, service-oriented governance, and where will I understand the investments necessary to realize that value? Those are the two things I would do. Okay. So that's a idea of a value model is, a, is a, an interesting one there to focus on what are the benefits of, uh, of, 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 of applying maybe different aspects of the model. Um, Bob, do you have uh, thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I think a value model is to some degree it, it has some similarities to a maturity model because I think they talk about the same things. Where is the value? And, what can governance do um, to help engender that value? So I, I, I think uh, that's along the same lines. Okay. And is there and, anything else you would you would change or, or re-emphasize in, in the SOA governance framework? No, I mean, I, I think the framework was uh, was and is a value uh, effort to you know start to put some standards in place uh, for, for SOA governance, and, uh, you know, it was a good first step, but I think there are other steps that uh, that would make sense to take along the lines of what um, we just talked about. Okay. Well, that's, uh, on, on that note, I think that's a, a good note to, uh, to finish this webinar, and I would again uh, like to give my thanks to our, our panelists, um, Bob Laird of IBM, uh, Jed Maxuba of Accenture, and Dave Hornford of Connexiam. And uh, on behalf of the Open Group, uh, this is uh, Chris Harding uh, signing off from this webinar and uh, thanking all of you who have participated. Uh, I hope you have uh, enjoyed it and gained benefit from it. Uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, your participation in future webinars. Thank you all very much. Yeah, thanks for hosting this, Chris. Appreciate it.